more people are understanding how to use this technology, both AI and mixed reality. And as more people think about it, rather than hiring that 20 temps, what else could I do? Mm -hmm. Could AI or mixed reality help me solve this business problem? Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. We're getting deep in some really cool technology today. I'm with Ted Dinsmore, president of SphereGen Technologies, based right here in the district in New Haven, Connecticut. Ted, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Ari. Thanks for having me. Listen, man, it's my pleasure. Made in America podcast. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Well, we make a lot of software, <laughs> augmented reality, mixed reality, extended reality, and then also an AI and RPA. Woof. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot a, of terms. Sorry. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. a lot of acronyms and mouthful. Uh, <laughs> we'll luckily, all that, yeah, right? exactly. Okay. We're going to explain all okay. that. Yeah, nerds like me probably get it already, but we'll yeah. we'll explain all that. And listen, I think it, this is a really topical time. I mean, there's so much talk about AI, uh, and I think I know we're going to get into some conversation about RPA and AI, and how in some ways AI is a rebranded name of stuff we've already had. But I think it's really cool what we're doing there, and the augmented reality and mixed reality and virtual reality been around for a little bit longer, but I think still in its infancy in terms of the adoption and what can be out there. And it's come a long way, uh, you know, in a while. So I'm really excited to get through all that. And we'll talk about that and really great examples of manufacturing companies you've worked with uh, and how that works and what the successes are and where you see it growing. Um, but let's just kind of get started from the the early days. Um, maybe sort of start off with, let me start a little bit with yourself and sort of sure. what got you interested in sort of this you know, I would say the, the intersection between deep information technology and sort of the real world sort of tactile touching things. Where did that sort of start for you? And, and So we've been at the, working around, we've been 15 years at SphereGen Technologies and we started out working with healthcare companies. We wrote a full EMR in Switzerland, which was a lot of fun. I learned a lot about multilingual. <laughs> And really thinking about how the relationship between language works in in all systems that we that we develop, uh, and thinking about that and bringing that forward, as it fast forward into augmented reality, mixed reality, that whole area, we really started thinking as okay, can we take gamification, take game developers, pair them with healthcare and manufacturing developers and see what we could create. <laughs> and we've created some amazing stuff by doing that. It's been a lot of fun. We've learned a tremendous amount and we've learned what people really want out of that space. Same with AI. We've started out with doing AI in a number of different forms over the past 20 years around cognitive services, speech recognition, text to voice. I mentioned the Swiss one. Everything was in German, French, Italian and English. So we had to do a lot of translation with that. We learned a lot about what's the best approaches when you're dealing with text and translation. And so like, what's your background personally? Are you a software developer? Software developer, way too many years. I don't want to say that. <laughs> but yeah, this is my, uh, uh, I sold my last company in 2008 and started this one in 2008. Um, and we've been, I've been developing for a way long time. So. Way long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think people might be surprised to know that SphereGen has been around for so long, right? I mean, most people think 15 years ago, what's this guy talking about, right? 15 years ago, the iPhone was pretty new. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, so we, we've certainly come a long way. So what was, what was going on in this world, you know, 15 years Years ago in 2008 when you started? So it was a lot of how do we do automation in, in what we call business process automation. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. How do we take system A to talk to system B and make that efficient and not have a lot of rekeying? Mm -hmm. uh, we've worked with APIs for 15, 20 years now. A lot of data integration issues has been the big issue in, in business that we focused on. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has multiple systems. It's how do I tie them together? And that evolved and, you know, and has evolved into what we see now with AI. We see a lot of data integration work in RPA. Right, just trying to automate some of that. I mean, it really just goes all the way back to like the early days of like database to database communication. Yeah. What can we do to sort of make human time more efficient, get rid of sort of the the monotonous rekeying data translation? How can we make that sort of uh, happen faster and it sort of improve, uh, you know, human effectiveness, uh, which I'm super passionate about. So that that's pretty neat. Um, what did you learn about augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality? Like, when did that kind of hit your radar? So that was about seven years ago. Microsoft came out with HoloLens 1, 
we have, we have, we've been a partner with Microsoft for 15 years. I wrote a book called Partner with Microsoft. So I had a lot of friends and one of my friends way, way back prior to launch HoloLens 1 called me up and said, hey, look at this. And I'd already played Google Glass before then. Um, and we really figured out, okay, this is going to be something. Uh, so we started, we, we went deep on it. We sent people to Seattle. We worked very closely with Microsoft on developing the software solutions around that. And it's, it's really paid off. It's a long-term thing. But you know, as you said, the market is kind of matured, but still we don't have a broad adoption in, in extended reality in the workplace. So let's actually give probably an opportunity to take a step back because I've been throwing out terms that I don't know if everyone understands. So, you know, I've used sort of three terms pretty loosely and quickly here. Uh, and I want to talk about the HoloLens too, because we'll have to talk about how it works. But we've talked about virtual reality or also right. known as VR. Right. We've talked it talked about augmented reality or what's known as AR mm -hmm. and then mixed reality, which can be, we called MR. So we'll try and use the full word so people don't get lost yeah. in okay. acronym <laughs> soup, which can happen. Um, but you know, Ted, can you explain for people that are listening, sure. you know, just go through each of them, VR, AR, MR, sure. what is it and, and how do they compare to each other? So let's start with augmented reality. Now, I know people won't see this, but I have my iPhone in front of me. And basically what I can do is scan this table. And I think I showed you this earlier, Ari, and I can put an object on the table and see where it is all around that object. So versus a flat screen, I can see three dimensionally around the object. You, you saw that when you played with it, mm -hmm. right? So that's an augmented reality experience. Which well, anyone who's done some shopping on some websites, exactly. the place your furniture in your room type of a thing. But let's just take that for a second. So how is that useful in manufacturing? We can place that machine there and see what it looks like before we bring it into the, to that assembly line. And that's mm -hmm. been used quite a bit over time. So we, sort of look at machine placement. So the, and that and that's that's AR? That's augmented reality. Correct. Right. So so right. you're so you're you're not interacting with it. You're just seeing something inside of the reality and typically you're looking at it on a phone or whatever. Or an and iPad. It's or a little bigger. Right. Yeah, right. got it. So something it, portable. Right. But, um, the uh, the Apple platform has the ability to place the object in augmented reality. They Got focus it. on that for quite a while. Now. And the idea is the ability to interact, not interact, but to be able to see something, right. how it will how it will fit mm -hmm. in real world space, and you to be able to walk around it, look over right. it or under it, and really see it in the real in the world in the world as it were. Absolutely, that's one use case. And the other one we see a lot is with training with AR. You know, if I want to show somebody this machine and I want to show you the inside of the machine without you taking apart the machine, I can have a 3D model of the machine and using augmented reality, I can take you apart or take it apart with you. So and you that can, was actually the example you showed me. You showed exactly. me like a part, which at first it just looked like a box. Right. But then as you step through it, it actually shows you how to like take the box apart and it explodes it. Uh, you, no, not explodes it blows it up, but but explodes it in the sense it of separate, it, yes. expands it, and you start seeing all the parts internally. So that's what you're talking about from a training perspective. Correct. Got Correct. it. And also from a sales perspective, we are seeing that uh, in sales booths, in in shows, we're seeing somebody has an augmented reality, an iPad usually, and you're showing your product or your, your big machine that you want to bring to that show um, as a digital twin of it. You can actually show somebody, here's what the machine looks like without bringing that huge machine into the show. Uh, so you could show it on an iPhone, iPad, even on a big screen in exactly. your booth or whatever. Exactly. Got it. Okay. So that's, that's AR. Right. That's Got augmenting it. the real world with a three-dimensional model. Got so, it. Virtual reality is probably the easiest one to jump to because a lot of people know in a virtual world, I'm in the virtual world, right. right? And I'm in that virtual world. And there's a lot of cool stuff you can do in the virtual world. If you look at the use cases around uh, pain management and healthcare and around, um, you know, training somebody. What's, to, what, how would you, how would VR, how would virtual reality help with pain management? Oh, so yeah, that's a, a lot of times you don't want to put some, uh, um, uh, especially a child under 12 under anesthesia. Good. So you try to put them in a virtual reality world, calm them and do epidurals, do different procedures with them without actually putting them under. That's a really? common use case of virtual reality. Yeah. I had no idea. So they're kind of mm -hmm. in another world watching of whatever. Yeah. So distraction. It's distracting their brain so that you don't have to put them under because you don't want to put kids under. And that's pretty effective? Yes, it's very effective. Oh, there's, uh, I think last I looked about 100 hospitals in the United States that use that very wow. regularly. So, okay. What are some other use cases for virtual reality? Well, like uh, in the manufacturing, I'm always used to the, the welder use case. Mm -hmm. We don't want to train people how to weld in, in any type of headset, but in a virtual world, Chain them how to weld is a pretty great thing, right? Because mm -hmm. they, they can make mistakes they can, and they won't hurt anybody and they're in a virtual world. They're just using the, the controllers and they're actually going through the steps of how to weld. Yeah, and actually I believe that uh, I want to say um, at one of the one of the colleges, 
Um, I can't remember which one right now, but one of the community colleges, they actually have like a virtual yes. reality welding, which allows you not only to weld virtually, but also you can change the environment, which is a really big impact for welding. So exactly. you want to weld in the desert, you want to weld underwater, you want to weld at high altitude, low altitude, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like you can, yeah. you can sort of, without having to fly all over the world, exactly. you can, you can see all those exactly. things. Right. Yeah. Virtual reality has great use cases in business today. Um, and, and we just have to know when to use them. And right. that's the hard thing. You look at realities, extended realities, what we call all these things. And there's so many options. How do I use these things in my business? Right. Oh, ask non talk, by the way, was the name of the school. All right. Yeah. Uh, that has it. So, and so we've got, so virtual reality is totally in the computer world. Correct. Augmented reality is placing something in the real world so you can see what it looks. And then we have mixed reality. Right. Now, mixed reality, there's two types of mixed reality. One where you can see through glasses. Think about a pair of sunglasses. Um, and there's a number of, uh, of glasses like that out in the market now and more coming out. And that's what the Microsoft HoloLens that's is. That's what the HoloLens is. Um, and that's what some of the other, Magic Leap is also that. There's, there's like four or five big brands that are doing that now. Um, and that allows you to see through the glasses, but projects out to uh, out on the 3D images on it. So it allows you to actually work with it holographically in the real space. So I'm seeing the world through my own eyes. Correct. But the but the glass in front of me allows it to project something else that I interact with or don't Correct. interact you with. Correct, you interact with, yes. So, uh, so now it's part of my reality, so I can Correct. push a button or whatever and do something with it. And you see Zuckerberg on the on the ones with, with Meta. Um, same thing, except they're not see-through, they're pass-through cameras, right? So the, so the Meta... The meta mixed reality, I'm not actually seeing with my own eyes. Correct. You're there's a with cameras. There's a camera in the front. Meta and, and Apple's are both the same. So Meta and Apple doing the camera route. Correct. The the leap and the Microsoft HoloLens are using your own eyes. What's the what would be the advantage of the camera front? Seems like it'd be more expensive and well it allows you to have one headset that does VR and MR. Uh, so it's a multi use headset. That's really why. The idea, all right, because you obviously can't do VR in the HoloLens version. Right, because you're, seeing, you're, seeing, you're, you're, always, seeing, right, you're right, always seeing yeah. the real world, yeah, so you're mixed yeah. only. Gotcha. I've seen people put, like, covers over it. I'm like, well, it isn't really the same thing. No, you know? that is not really the same thing. Um, the camera seems like it would potentially cause some issues with a delay. Uh, is that true? It is a slight issue with delay, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want my surgeon to be using the, the mixed reality on that. Gotcha. Uh, but there are use cases where it's useful. So particularly in collaboration use cases of mixed, mixed reality, uh, those headsets are kind of useful when we're collaborating. Gotcha. Yeah, mixed through that. Okay, great. So that makes a ton of sense. So let's pivot to like another yeah. topic. Mm -hmm. You said this whole thing started out really, Ted, in healthcare. So where did where was the healthcare use cases? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, was it all was it all in VR, MR, AR, one thing? Kind of walk us through, you know, how that all started and we'll get to manufacturing after that. Well, you know, in healthcare, it's very interesting because we are three-dimensional people and you've had CT or MRIs before, right, Ari? Sure. So a few surgeries they, too, even. A few surgeries, yeah. <laughs> then they show you these two-dimensional slices of us. Oh. And I'll, I'll go back to, we met one doctor in, New, in Yale, New Haven, and he said, what's wrong with this, Ted? I'm in surgery, and I'm basically looking at a piece of plastic on a light box, and my kid is at home in 3D pop-up display. I'm like, you know, doc, you're right. And I, it really took a little humble pie on my problem. Like, you know, he's got a real Call of point. Duty on the Xbox should not be more not technically be more competent than, than the, the surgical. The surgical yeah, fair enough. So, fair so enough. we started on a journey in surgery, and it, it has, it has continued to this day. I actually have a separate product company focused on that. And we're doing remote surgery between remote locations, uh, Uganda to New York, for example. You've done, you guys have supported a surgery being remotely. done in Uganda. Like how does that kind of walk us through? So the sur surgeon remotely, uh, who, who's a brilliant, good guy, but he may, he may never see that case once in his lifetime. Got it. So he has the headset on. The surgeon back in New York or Boston sees a case three times a week. Right. So he knows, oh, hey, if you're doing this type of cut on this, you might want to use this type of incision. So it's not like you're training a surgeon remotely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But however, uh, even Cleveland Clinic, all of their their students that graduated the past two years have all been trained holographically, not really? on actually cadavers. Correct. So in medical education, you see a huge, huge uh, piece using both virtual reality and mixed reality in actual training of students and then actual usages in surgery remotely. And for that, there is a lot of cases where you're doing surgery where you want to see how far you penetrate um, the needle, for example. 
Okay. And when you're putting it in somebody's brain, that's kind of <laughs> important not to go too far, right? Um, so they're using this. Te- millimeters count. And millimeters do count, yeah. They're using this technology to place the 3D hologram over top the patient and see how how far they go. So I'll uh, be wearing, say, like a HoloLens yeah. set. Right. And I'll look at the patient's head. Mm-hmm. A 3D image, sort of like a manufacturer speak, a digital twin. A digital twin. Would Correct. go right over the Correct. top of the person's head. Correct. And as I'm putting the needle through, I will see... They'll tell me, hey, put it in here. Mm-hmm. And then as I get close to the thing, slow down, slow down, boop, you're there no, type it, of a- It isn't quite that way. So, because it's the scan of that person. So okay. there's, there's not the going, going, boop. It still is the, the skill of the surgeon, right? We're, we're not doing, it, it's not been used in a way that you're replacing the surgeon. Got this it. is a tool for the surgeon. Okay. And just to pivot that, it's a tool for manufacturing as well. When you have a remote situation like remote surgery during Uganda, well, we can do remote uh, set up a fix of something at a plan, right? right. Uh, well, well, we have a lot of times where we have uh, a plan in Germany or a plan in another country where we have to go and support it or we have to fix something there. We have somebody in the remote side put a headset on and you can see through their eyes. A lot of times in the machines, you look at these machines, they're huge, you know? The remote support functionality within both healthcare and manufacturing is a big use case for mixed reality. So the you know let's let's talk about some of the manufacturing use cases a little bit. So mm-hmm. so you, you you know look it's it's certainly pretty obvious where if the person's in Germany and you're here you right. know that's an issue and certainly I know there's people listening to the show that that could be uh, could be part of and I know there was a use case actually I think it's something you and I talked about a couple of years ago of a business that sold their business here in Connecticut and had retired to another state mm-hmm. and they had some tools there that they needed the support for and rather than have to be here they took they did the HoloLens idea, and, and I don't know if people know all this, but you don't have to have, you don't use the two HoloLens or need some big setup rig yeah. with like a laptop mm-hmm. and someone else wearing the HoloLens and a Teams call, you can yeah. show them, hey, you need to fix this part, like touch here. Maybe you should explain how that. Yeah. Well, so I'll give you a use case. A friend of mine in Buffalo called us and she has a plant. She just took over the plant and she had all these machines were made by these three, three gentlemen who were now in their late 60s and early 70s. And they had to hire new people to take their place, but they wouldn't let anybody tr- anybody touch the machines to fix them. <laughs> the older guys, you know, God bless them, they built the machines. So they knew how to fix them. So, they, oh, well, it's quicker for us to fix it. But how do you get that next generation to understand that? And they had bring guys. So what they did was they, they had the next generation kids put the HoloLenses on, right? And they, they sent the three gentlemen on vacation to Florida on the beach, right? Now you can kind of see that where it's just going, right? So they have the we have an iPad on the beach and they're the first week they were doing like almost six hours a day as the guys in the plant were fixing the machines. And I was on one of the calls. I, swear, I, I really couldn't believe this. They're inside the machine and the guy says, oh, reconnect the red wire. And there's seven red wires in the <sighs> machine. The poor guy inside the machine would never be able to know how, he's, well, I met the one on the left. Okay. Okay, which left, you know, right. I'm in the middle of a machine. How do, so by training this way, by, you know, mentoring this way remotely. Now, the only problem we did have, to be honest with you, was they were sitting at the beach with an iPad. What do you think happened? Either lost Wi-Fi or started drinking cocktails. Or started both. drinking cocktails. Oh. You got, you got, and they dropped the iPad in the sand. Oh. And they had to go get a new iPad. But other than that, it was fine. And, and eventually, after three weeks being on the beach in Florida, the, the guys in the plant hardly had to call them at all. So it really helped them feel better that, you know, for the, for the general manager of the plant, a good friend of mine, she's just like, this was the best way to get this knowledge to a new workforce um, and make it really effective. Because because remember, when you have these headsets on, your hands are free, right? Correct. I can work with the equipment with my hands free, such as the surgeon in Uganda, the 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 guy fixing the machine in, in uh, New Haven or wherever. It, it really, you, you, you hands free is really critical to it. Yeah, it's so important. And actually just one thing to, to just say, what I think is so cool about it is the person who's doing the training, let's say, they're just sitting in front of their computer, yeah. looking at what you're seeing on their screen, just like any other yeah. call. And then they can use their mouse to like circle the red wire. Right. And the person wearing the glasses sees the wire in real life yep. being circled. So it's like that red wire. Mm-hmm. Um, can you record these yeah. sessions and then use them for future training? You do. Yeah. Definitely. So, so I mean, even if you're not even remote per se, but even in a, lo- even if you're just training in your own local shop, having this setup and being able to train in real time, yeah. not only probably helps the people being trained, but man, when you're trying to train like with a with a with a notepad or written instructions, you got to keep you read, you reference, then you go back, and you've got yeah. two different mediums. This just seems so much more efficient. 
three-dimensional training is much more much more efficient than any video we take. So a lot of times you mentioned digital twins. So digital twins are very useful in this technology, right? We can create a digital twin of a machine and have all the parts. So you can take it apart. You can actually put it back together. You can see all the components. So training is, is a huge use case for this. So let's talk a little bit about that. So do you have, so you, you mentioned the sort of the Buffalo, what other sort of examples, real world examples can you give us of training that people might be able to connect to? So a lot of our, we're seeing training of applications within the plant going on, you know, a gimbal walkthrough is. Sure. Right? So you're doing a walkthrough of that plant and you're seeing everything through the eyes of the general manager at that time. And, and I know it sounds kind of, Corny, it could do it with a with a GoPro or something like that, but to see the, all the three dimensionality of everything. So all these headsets, and you may have heard when Apple came out, spatial computing, right? Actually, I've not heard of that. Yeah, a Apple's big thing about their headset is a spatial computing. Well, spatial computing has been around for a while, and basically we're mapping out the environment using this technology. So it's a really interesting way to see how we can spatially place things. The use case I think we've talked about a number of times where they're doing stenciling around a container. Right. Uh, well, it's it's more production than just training because they're actually doing the production work. But it kind of goes on to training as well, uh, where we're actually um, taking and placing something spatially aware on the container and then doing the stencils around that. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think you should get into that because that was an example you gave me sort of I think you've explained it to me a couple of times off camera. Let's not give everyone else the benefit of okay, yeah. hearing it for the first <laughs> time. But maybe walk us through because I think this sure. is a really interesting and one of the things we talked about is this technology is available and maybe people sort of know it's out there, but without knowing how to implement it in their life, they go a different direction. I think this example that you gave is just a, a perfect for me was like every, 99 out of a hundred people would have done it the old school way. Right. Hopefully we can, we can fix that. So maybe just talk about sure. what happened, the problem and solve you. Yeah. So what the client did was actually had a container, a very large container that he had to put certain stencils around certain spots of it. But like don't touch hot, lift exactly, to open, exactly. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Don't hit this this switch. Um, pressurized containers. These are very pressurized containers. Um, so what he had to do, and he knew he had a a really big order coming in, had to deliver within like three months of it. He knew he was going to have to hire like 30, 40 temps, as you said, uh, to actually make that order. But he actually got with us and thought differently. He's like, okay, how can I use this technology and do it much quicker, f cheaper, faster, right? Mm -hmm. And more accurate too. Because, you know, when you have new people coming in, Ugh. you got to train them, you got to make sure they're doing the right thing. They're temporary usually. So you just, you know, there's a lot of factors there. That is the old school way we did it, right? Right. I was going to say, if someone else said, hey, I got a big order of this things coming in and I know every unit's going to take me like a hundred hours of stenciling, exactly. I got to bring in these, like, I got to bring in temps. That's the only way to do it. Right. And the and short term right. people, because I'm not going to surge right. full times. So yeah. Right. So rather than taking the hundred hours, uh, we actually just have a QR code on the on the th on the uh, cylinder. We use the holographic projection and spatial mapping. So we map out the container and we put it in the right spot. And then the person doing the stenciling just knows, oh, it goes there. Not one goes there. Number two goes there. Number three goes there. And they take the time it takes it down to about thirty minutes. So it, it wasn't hundred hours. It was several right. hours to do it, taking the whole process down to a very manageable time. So you could do it with existing staff. So you just, so basically using the technology, this is a mixed reality implementation. Correct. Correct. So we need to figure out where to place stuff on a unit mm -hmm. and it's sort of repeated, but, but it needs to be precise. Correct. So boom, spatially map it. Now these people wear the lens, reduce the time by like 80% that it takes to yeah. do it. Yeah. And now we can get it done with our existing staff. Yes. And uh, take that again to the, the quality uses cases that when I'm looking at a quality control process where, and this is kind of, we blend into AI and I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping subjects here. I know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but when we have, we're using spatial computing and we're actually looking at two objects, let's say these two mugs, for example, um, and w we can compare them using AI and the spatial awareness and say, Hey, this is a, take a picture of the two mugs. This is a broken one. Right? This is a broken part. So we're using spatial computing with AI to actually determine whether something is an effective quality level that we want on, a, on that piece of that equipment and not. Yeah, sort of combining human inspection with digital inspection at the same time. Correct. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, let's do one more example for um, mixed reality. I, I think you had mentioned uh, in our prep, there was like a setup example. You had a customer that was using mixed reality for setup. 
um, set of new equipment that they sold? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, they had sold the equipment and into, and these are big pieces of equipment. They have to send a team of people to go install them um, in other countries. Uh, and really, really great team of people, very organized engineers. And they said, you know what? What if we sent a mixed reality headset along with it and we gave them some holographic instructions on how to set up? And we're going to send one guy rather than five. <laughs> Let's see how that works. And it worked really well. They were really pleasantly surprised about how you set up the, the piece of equipment. And a lot is it around the, the size of where you place that piece of equipment, how it's angled. And when you do that, a digital twin, back to the digital twin piece, I can see where it's at and I can see how to set up. Oh, okay, it'd be more efficient if I did it this way. Then I go and set it up in that right spot. I'm not putting it and moving it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then they set up instructions. Oh, you, you, you've done Ikea. You've done many, <laughs> many things setting up, right? There's always that where's uh, slot B, C, you know. <sighs> 100%. And every engineer tries to make it simple as possible, but there's some knowledge you have to do, right? And when you look at instructions, that are, whether it's video or on paper, they're two-dimensional versus three-dimensional. When you see it, you can understand it much quicker. So, yeah, so, that's, so that example of sort of helping someone with a setup yeah. uh, has been really helpful. They had, uh, originally when they first started doing it, it was a little longer to get the setups than it was having the five guys they send out, but there was a cost savings, of course. Uh, but as they were doing it more and more, they found that like the fourth and fifth one got quicker to do. And is it I, is it hard for people who haven't done it before mm -hmm. to sort of get into the mixed reality? Like, you know, how odd is it? How, how is it? Is it like, what's the time to sort of make it Okay, I get how to do this. It, it is age dependent, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, the have, older, the better, probably. Nah, <laughs> uh, well, the digital natives, I'll go back to the surgery example. We have digital native uh, surgeons that are now come out of college in this and they've been doing it. And we talk to them once or twice and they're off and running. We just don't, you know. As the age of the surgeon, it takes a little more hand holding. So, uh, yeah, it does depend on how open you are, and the, and more digital native does help. So. Yeah. So the so you think so as you're sort of seeing as the generation, yeah, as, as the as as the sand slips through the hourglass, yep. the the newer sand's a little bit more uh, more amenable to this stuff and easier to live up to it. And we are seeing uh, the newer sand demand it now, both in manufacturing and in in healthcare, where you see like, hey, I want to be working with the newest technology. I have VR headset at home. Right. I play with it. You know, I have Xbox or uh, PS2s or PS5s, right? Yep. You know, I have this technology. Why can't I use that at work? So we, you know, we saw in the iPhone and like in the, uh, you know, uh, beginning of the 2000, we're now starting to see that with augmented reality and manufacturing. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, and people do adapt. To, just as a side note, I was thinking about the iPad, my, about the iPhone myself, because when it first kind of really started to get hot, remember BlackBerry was the big thing. Yeah. One yeah. of the things I heard from a lot of the older generation folks was they would never want to use a phone that didn't have a built-in keyboard. Right. Like you can't do the on-screen <laughs> keyboard. Now, not a single phone has, has the, yeah. uh, the built-in <laughs> keyboard. Uh, and the other thing that's kind of neat from just a training perspective that I just want to touch on briefly for myself that I, that I found in, in chatting with you is that in a lot of ways, especially when you're talking about training, it's the newer folks that have to use more of the newer tech, right? So in the example you gave of the of the Buffalo manufacturer and the people on the beach, the people on the beach are using an iPad or can be using a laptop and a mouse, right. which is very familiar technology to them. Absolutely. It's the newer, younger folks that are on site who yeah. are wearing the HoloLens and really working in the mixed reality mode. Right. So in this situation, you can almost get a lot of bang for your buck because the the older folks that are doing the training are using more familiar technology. It's the Correct. newer folks using it. Okay. Yep. Perfect. We've done a ton with uh, the augmented reality and, and the VR and stuff. Um, it's taken me a long time to get to, but I do want to talk about AI. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously AI is huge. Everyone's talking about AI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where does that kind of fit into your milieu? Tell me how you think about AI and, and what it means to you in this context. So we started our journey with process automation 15 years ago, right? Business process automation, as we're talking about connecting systems together. And then we got into cognitive services. How do we use data and translate for text and things like that? Then we got into what was called as robotic process automation. How can we train w robots basically to do what humans do on a keyboard or on a screen? And I just want to touch on the reason I keep seeing that more and more is because we used to write APIs to connect databases, and we still write APIs to connect databases together. We were talking about that earlier. Um, but we still have a lot of use cases where you can't get to that 
that database because that is now in the cloud. That's a mm. SaaS vendor. SaaS vendor does not want you to connect to their yeah. database. They want you to go through their UI. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the intelligent automation functions of creating web bots to do what humans do to interact with the UI that's in cloud applications. Does that, does that make sense, that part of it? Mm. No. Yeah, no, say it again. <laughs> so we're seeing intelligent automation, which is using AI to interpret to that, what that screen is and actually put the data, the right data in the screen rather than the human have to do it. Got it. So what we naturally used to do with APIs and still do with database integration, because these are cloud-based systems and locked down a lot of cases, we only have a UI interface to work with. So you have to train the system to be like a human using the interface that yes. the human would use. Correct. We have, yeah. to, we have to train the web bot to be a an AI web bot to be what a human does. Which for people on the outside might be like, well, that doesn't seem, how could that be any more difficult than the other way around? But it's actually much, much more, more difficult. difficult. <laughs> yeah, because in the other in the other way around, if you're doing database to database or an API, yeah. you basically just say, match up this column with this column, make it happen. Versus exactly. if I have to look at a screen, I've got to read, understand, and acknowledge where on the screen I got to be, which could move around any number of different ways. And think about like date formats. Oh, Simple yeah. fields like that, right? In an API, we know what the date format is. Right, right? it's standard 222 two, two, or 224 two, or, yeah, yeah. On screens, it's wherever that screen developer graded it. Right. right? Drop downs, all the stuff that uh, from a developer perspective that we are you know, used to for UI is now very difficult for, for, you need intelligent automation, hence AI, to deal with. Mm. The other part, we still see a lot of paper in, in the manufacturing process and in healthcare as well. Um, I'll give the example of a, you know, what your material certification coming into a plant, right? Mm -hmm. Plant uh, Raw material comes into a plant. They have a material cert. I mean, I, I've been amazed. I, I've, I, I sat on this project for a while and how crumpled up pieces of paper they are that the driver had spilled his coffee on. And the poor guard then has to then take it and give it to five other people to put into their systems, quality system, the ERP system, the accounting system, all the different systems that need that information about that raw material came into our plant, our planning systems, all of our project management uh, systems. So what has happened before is somebody actually takes the piece of paper and looks at it and keys it, right? Now we can use AI to look at that and say, oh, aluminum is ALUM here. On this system, it's AL. On this system, it's aluminum right? All those different pieces of data can be taken off that piece of paper, put in the right systems using an AI and not have to need that guard and that four different people to do that, that inter interaction. So, so like, so that, so the idea is what you take that and how does it get, who reads it? Like you put the paper you in your computer, scan, scan it, it throw yeah. it to an email inbox and then the, the AI is waiting on the inbox and then the AI picks it up, determines what it is. And let me be honest, with the first, when you implement this, we got like 70% out of the box, which we were really excited about. That's actually more than I would have guessed. Before. I know. Because it yeah. it, it's, a, you know, I mean, now we're going to get super nerdy, but there's this idea of like what's structured versus unstructured data, right? Exactly. And 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 uh, the crumpled up piece of paper in the delivery man's pocket with or without coffee is the most unstructured data <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can yeah, come up yeah. with, right? How, how crumpled is the paper? Right. Is it is it the yellow paper or the white paper? Right. Are you getting the original copy or whatever? Oh, no, and no, then, no, original copy? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Come on. And there's probably sometimes handwritten crossouts. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, quantity's not 100, it's like 90 well, or whatever. The, the order number's always handwritten, oh, you know, on that stuff. It always is. And, you know, not not the fault of the driver. No, 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 listen, the that's... 10 different companies that ship to to that plant, you know, and you got seventy percent out of the box. We did, and we were we were surprised, honestly, you know. Uh, and it's been going better now. We're about ninety to ninety two percent right now. So, so I, I kind of imagine. It. Well, clearly the seventy was shockingly high. Mm -hmm. Probably getting from seventy to eighty is one thing. Eighty to ninety is like a lot harder. Yeah. Ninety to ninety one is probably harder than the original seventy. You know, what I mean. Well, the way this works actually is fascinating. You know, because you you kind of have a learning management model, uh, uh, and we're actually. You just keep training it. So from setting up from a technology perspective, we set up how the AI works, and then we just keep feeding it data, and it gets smarter and smarter. So when you, it's like training. It's training the, 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 the AI module, correct. So, I mean, the way that just to, so the way that it, say, works is I scan the thing in, then someone has to validate that the information the machine read is what's on the paper? So the machine's going to try to do as much as possible and then pass it to the human saying, hey, we have all this data that we know we're, we're like 90% on or 70% when we start, right? Then they would either validate or they'd say, yeah, go ahead and we go into all the different systems need to. And they fill in, oh, this one we can't read. There's no way we can figure out what this is. Right. 
So what is the level of accuracy that needs to be impactful in a positive way? Because let's just take this from the beginning. Someone might be listening and going, well, the thing's only 92% accurate. Right. How useful is that? Well, how useful, how accurate do you think the human, uh, exactly. and that, so I think that's exactly. the other piece, right? Exactly. Every, like, we, the, certainly it's not a hundred percent. Right. And it could be as low as 70% mm -hmm. just from compliance and whatnot. Yeah, um, yeah. So what level, I mean, is 90% very good in terms of? That's really good. If okay. you get like 20%, you're saving a lot of time. Right. So even 20%, it's a matter of time saving for that plan. So that, so just the ability. So it's, so 70%, I take the thing, I scan it instead of what I did do was like data entry it. Right. Correct. Um, five different times. What do you mean? Because it's five different systems. I got a day. It's got to go in. Oh, I forgot about that part. So it's not even just the one time data yeah. entry. It's the, it's the multiple different systems I got to put it in. So even if I have to spend a little extra time correcting the original data feed. Exactly. I correct it once. I can, it's just going to. Goes five different places. Yeah. And then over time, presuming you get similar delivery people with a similar level of handwriting. Yeah. The accuracy is going to go up, up, up and up. Uh, wow. That's great. Um, what are other opportunities to use AI in a manufacturing environment in this way? Well, we touched about quality and I, I think quality right now we're, we're like on the beginning of quality right? Where we can use AI to measure quality factors. And we have some clients that, you know, do CT scans of all their hardware to see that they actually, all that component, that part to see how accurate it is. So think about back to the medical use case, we're using CT scans and MRIs, and we're having AI module determine whether you have cancer or not, right? That, that's been going on for quite some time now. Now we're talking about all those factors in the quality process that we're actually measuring, you know, whether it's we're measuring by eyesight, we're measuring by cameras, we're measuring by scanners. All those things can be fed into AI modules and to really true, truly understand is that quality issue. So, and again, we're just starting on that. You're seeing a lot of vendors coming out in the quality space now around that. But I think that's going to blow up more and more and more. Because, you know, think how much time is spent in quality control in every manufacturing organization. And it's a very hard position to hire for. I mean, I'm hearing about co trying to hire for quality nonstop. It's yeah. it's really difficult. Yeah. So just, uh, I, I know we're, we're kind of long in the tooth on time, but just bear with me for a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the things you mentioned, I, I don't even remember if it was off camera or in prep, but I wonder if there's a connection here, is you sort of said, as the, medic, as the medical use case has evolved over time, it's sort of bifurcated into not so much the ad hoc solutioning that sort of says, hey, let's have a, you know, a mixed reality, you know, expertise in the business and we'll just sort of figure out places to do it. Although there's some of that and we gave some manufacturing examples, but in healthcare, you sort of said, oh, it started to become somewhat productized. And so, oh, yeah. here's a repeat use case we need. Here's sort of a sub product that it's very easy to digest and understand. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know how to implement it. You just buy it and, and that thing works for you. Right. Um, and it seems like that's, kind of what's taken off the, gotten the most consistent traction, which makes right. sense because it's, yeah. for all the reasons I said, easy to consume, easy to buy, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. Do you view the manufacturing ecosystem sort of moving the same way that as you figured things out, mm -hmm. that it'll be more like, oh, there's a quality solution yes. and I buy that versus the other way? Yes, I totally, and right, right now there's a lot of, there's both right now. It depends on what problem you're trying to solve, back to the business problem in manufacturing. So we are seeing one-off, like the, the stenciling piece yep. with mixed reality and AI. Which is a huge success story, by the way. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The, the, the use cases are consistently, more people are understanding how to use this technology, both AI and mixed reality. And as more people think about it, rather than hiring that 20 temps, what else could I do? Mm -hmm. Could AI or mixed reality help me solve this business problem? Opening the eyes, and uh, again, the culture change, that that uh, sand of time is changing things. We have digital natives con constantly come to us and other people and saying, hey, how can I use technology to help me rather than hiring 10 more people? So, you know, people are listening to this and thinking, Ted, this shit's really cool. Yeah. But I don't even have the first idea of how I would implement it or where I can implement it. How do you, what do you coach those people on, you know, so that they don't stop listening to the show and, <laughs> and be like, great idea. And then six months later they hear about it again and they're like, oh yeah, I should do something with that. And it doesn't happen. And that is a constant challenge. <laughs> so, and there are a lot of people like me out there, but you need to talk to somebody that's actually working with it and give, give the business problem and have some technologies to look at it and say, Hey, can we help you? And also, can we help you in a cost effective manner? Like I look at the ROI on the material cert thing, 
it's got a huge ROI for that manufacturer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and these things can be helped along um, in, in the in the digital world right now. Digital natives are very critical in this. I really do embrace that. You know, the digital native looking at it and saying, "Hey, how can I use technology to do this?" happens on almost automatically. So look around your organization at some digital natives and get them involved and get them thinking about what, how can we use technology in a better way. Are there opportunities to engage? I have no idea if this is even something SphereGen does, but is there an opportunity to go to SphereGen or someone else mm -hmm. and say, hey, like come to my shop and sure. like let's spend a day and like are there opportunities here you know, could, like someone who kind of understands the technology, is that something that you guys do? That's an available opportunity? Yes, yes, absolutely. We're working with one plant in Ohio right now. It's been fascinating because they do uh, uh, 3D printed molding. Mm -hmm. And they have problem when they're when they're taking the molds out, they have to blow the sand out. Are you familiar with that process? Mm -hmm. um, and they came to us and they said, you know, just come and look at what we're doing. And we looked at what we're doing we're like, well, it's pretty easy. We have a 3D map already. We can give you an augmented reality to show you where to put the vacuum and not break the stuff in it. <sighs> and it was just, you know, they said, come and see. And that was great because it was a very different use case. You know, we had to train the the uh, the models on and it. Was, every digital twin is different, different in yeah. that case. Right, you know? right, right. Because these are all the, within their stands. But it's, it's fascinating. Once you get in there, you start looking at it, you're like, oh. And it's cost effective for them because if they break, their breakage is down by 5%. Hey, that really helps their end of day product. Yeah, for sure. Especially because it's like a one, it's not, there's not like this giant recurring cost, right? Yeah. You, it's, there's some development costs. Yeah. You, it's like every other thing. You sort of make some investment to make yourself more efficient and then you mm -hmm. reap the rewards for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's a really cool thing. Do you partner with any organizations to like help get the technology out there? Well, CCAT has been a great partner with us. So is ConStep and eWIB. Um, CCAT actually, we're doing a web uh, event with them on January 24th. We'd really? Love for you to come. Okay. Else? All right. Invitation uh, received. Which we're January 24th, 2024. Are you guys doing an event at CCAT in East Hartford? CCAT in East Hartford. And, and what's the event all about? We're going to be demonstrating the two, two of the use cases that I talked about today. We're actually showing them, showing you how to do material cert uh, and also a quality uh, test. Uh, with AI, so oh, it's wow. really so about AI. Oh, the two things we two, two of the examples we, we talked, talked about, about. We're going to be we've got them in CCAT demoing, and they're they're testing them and making sure everything works well. Uh, but we're actually showing them. They'll, they'll be showing them. We'll be with them showing them. Oh, that's CCAT's really cool. CCAT's been a great place for us to showcase stuff because they have all that cool uh, cool equipment we can play. Uh, listen, if the Center for Advanced Technology is not the place to show this, I don't know what <laughs> exactly, is. Exactly, um, exactly. <laughs> so that's really cool. So um, that's awesome. So uh, January 24th, that CCAT, people want to see it. They can go there. It's a free event? Yes, or, yes. So that's cool. Um, and what do you see, you know, so what's sort of what's sort of next for you in terms of, or SphereGen, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what we're talking about here in, in manufacturing? What do you see coming next? Yeah, I, I see so much in the AI space. Space. I, I think we're, you know, pe people are kind of afraid of AI as it's coming new. I'm a person I've embraced everything new possible because I think it's interesting. I'm a geek, like you Got said, it. you know, and I think we're we're on this more like, Star Trek, less Terminator than exactly a more Star Trek. But we, we're seeing so much use cases here of using big data, things that we've had for a long time yep. that are coming together. Right, large learning models wouldn't work without big data. Right, without a lot of training, a lot of the components that we've had for years, like cognitive recognition, speech recognition, that all is coming along, 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 and now we're an influence like oh it's all coming together okay now what can we really do with it so there's tons of use cases i see coming for that dude you just i mean you want to talk llms big data yeah. the advancement of technology like the hardware that's really enabling all this anyway i could go on for hours but i can't uh because <laughs> we're out of we're out of time uh ted thanks a lot for coming on well, i just so want to ask you some like kind of i like to ask some broad questions at the end sure. so if you'll indulge me yeah. um do you have a favorite business book uh my own. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? No, I wrote a book called Partner with Microsoft. Which I just, the favorite th thing about that was I got to interview people like you in the Microsoft Solution uh, Provider Network, and I got to understand about 300 different companies that do things slightly different than us. And fascinating to me was the partner-to-partner -partner model. I, I spent a lot of time interviewing partners, how they work together. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a fascinating thing, because how people work together in uh, in, in concert to solve business problems is an amazing piece to me. So that's one of my favorite business books. All Sorry. right, that's Self plug there. That's Sorry. good. No, I, got, I, got, I like it. Um, if you had to do something other than be president of SphereGen, mm -hmm. and it could be anything in the whole wide world, Ted, what would you do to pass your time? Hmm, that's a hard one. It'd probably be teaching. I, I spent a lot of time with Quinnipiac University, University of New Haven, um, and and with Southern University. Um, I really do think there's there's a lot we can do in opening up the minds of younger people 
particularly to this new technology, because they get it. I was a visiting professor for St. George University in, in Grenada uh, for five years. And I went down once or twice a year to teach the professors how to use this technology, right? Literally so, teaching the teacher. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. most of the teachers were in their 70s, 80s, right? Uh, so talking about Octarian, how to, how to click, a, <laughs> click a mouse on an island, it was really fun. But it, it was great. I, I taught 170 professors how to use this technology. We graduated 10,000 students. I taught zero students. Wow. You just had to give it to them and explain it to them what it could do. It was fascinating. I, I th so I think there's so much more we can do with the next generation. Dude, I love that. Um, Ted, what's something that you learned early in your life or early in your career that you think helped propel you to all the success you've had? I think it's worth, I was, grew up an uh, army brat, so we were around the world. We were every place. And you got thrown into a situation, you had to work with a lot of people. Right. That was how it all worked. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of different people from a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that has helped me full, full disclosure. My daughters were from China. Most of my uh, operations in India, I work a lot internationally. I, I really love working with, I think the skill that I learned early was, Hey, you're dumped in situation, get the best minds involved, find out who they are, no matter where they are and bring them together to solve your problem. I do. That's pretty cool. Uh, what's something, Ted, that you've learned later in your life or later in your career that if you went back and told young Ted, and if young Ted would listen to you, you think it'd make a real positive impact on his life? Mm, breathe. <laughs> breathe. <laughs> breathe, yeah. <laughs> doesn't I, that I, come automatically? No, it doesn't, uh, actually. I, I've studied yoga for the past 15 years. And I think if I had done that 30 years ago, I'd have been a much calmer, better leader than I am right now. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, learning how to breathe and how to go slowly through things and take your time is definitely something. As a leader, you want to charge, right? We want to go run up that hill, right? We really we're sitting back and breathing. And in yoga, you do three level breathing and you know meditation. That really has helped me later on in my life. That if I saw younger Ted, I'd be like, "Hey, man, just breathe," you know. Really? So can you just elaborate on that just a little bit more? You're saying what, sure. like, just sort of. Don't take every, is it, is it sort of the same thing as don't take everything so seriously or is it more like stop trying to rush to the solution and take the time to really like survey what's going on? Like connect the dots there a little bit. Yeah. It's to take time in yoga. You, you do two or three breaths coming in and one out, right? It, depending how good your practice is. And when you're doing that, you're, you're thinking, you're internalizing it more and you're thinking through your processes as a leader. We have to think through what our decisions are to, to what we're doing for our customers or our employees, to everybody involved, right? If we take the time ourselves to do that, that is really a critical thing. When you're younger, you're trying to go faster, right? So if you, if you took your time and actually thought through, hey, I'm going to make this decision for my business or I'm going to back this idea within my company or I want to move this idea forward to my customers, take AI. Is AI a good thing? Right now, we don't know. We need to actually understand it and see it in the use cases before we actually know, is AI good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. This whole discussion about AI good or bad, I'm like, we don't know yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> is my mm -hmm. opinion. And I think we as leaders in, in particularly in, in technology need to breathe and kind of understand all that first. Dude, that's a great lesson, Ted. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate you letting me geek out a bit. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> all right, man. We'll see you next time around. Thank you. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.